very broad question about the future of capitalism. General future of yeah. capitalism. <laughs> well, first of all, we should bear in mind that capitalism is a bit of a myth. We don't really have capitalist societies. We have state capitalist societies. And the state has always played an essential, central role in, in uh, development and uh, ex extension of the capitalist system. So that goes back to England in the 17th century and all the way through the history of development. But let's just take the recent period. So take today's high-tech economy. Now take, say, your iPhone. Now if you take your iPhone and you take the technology in it and take it apart, it turns out that almost everything comes from the state sector. Uh, the GPS was developed by the Navy. Um, the Electronics was developed in military labs, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. uh, the computer that's in front of you. The computers began to be developed in the 1950s, actually in large part in the lab where I happened to be working. Uh, it wasn't until 1977 that Apple was able to produce a computer that could be marketed for profit. That's after about 30 years of research and development in the state sector. Now, suppose we had capitalist societies. Uh, one of the principles of capitalism is supposed to be that if you uh, invest in something, especially if you invest to make a risky, costly investment over, say, 30 years, and there's some profit that comes out, it's supposed to go back to you. But our system doesn't work like that. It goes to Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos. Now, the public pays the costs through various devices, you know, university labs, and so on. And then after many years, uh, something is handed over to private corporations, and they make the profit. Same with the Internet. Uh, the beginnings of the Internet were in the late 1950s, actually in the same lab where I was working at MIT. Uh, they began the thinking about the Internet. And it developed uh, over decades uh, under the, within the government system, meaning taxpayer support. Uh, finally, in around 1995, the public made a gift, simply a gift to private corporations to say, OK, you guys can have the Internet that we developed. Uh, now we have the half a dozen huge mega corporations which run the Internet. It's a pub it's public gift, you know. Mm -hmm. And in fact, across the board, that's the way it is. It'd be the same if you go back uh, to the 19th century, when the uh, uh, what was called the American system of production developed, kind of amazed the world, you know, mass production, uh, quality control, interchangeable parts. Uh, uh, most of it was developed in government armories. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where... You can do experimentation. You can you, you can make investments uh, for the long term. Pro private corporations don't do that. They want to make profit tomorrow. You know, not invest for what might happen in 30 years. You know, and that's in fact the entire history of development of what we call capitalism and its current function. If you look at the present, uh, take the people who are saying we have to have a small government and. Uh, devote ourselves to the market and just look at how they live. There are huge public subsidies, government subsidies, to every major sector of the economy. Uh, agribusiness, uh, energy, uh, finance, uh, they're all heavily publicly subsidized. Uh, uh, but that's okay. That's a proper function of the government, just not pensions and uh, security and health and irrelevant things like that. Uh, so that's what's called capitalism, but it's a very specific, uh, specifically shaped and designed form of capitalism. So can that survive? Well, yeah. it sh certainly shouldn't survive. Sure, sure. And um, I think that can be changed. In fact, the public wants it to be changed. So again, if you take a look, the United States is a very heavily polled society, uh, mainly because business wants to know what people think. That's important. So we know a lot about people's attitudes. Uh, one thing we know is that across the spectrum, uh, people want much higher taxes on the rich. The taxes keep going down. Uh, in fact, those results usually aren't even reported. That uh, 
of the uh, uh, even people who you know are considered uh, very right wing Tea Party. Let's say mm -hmm. if you take a look at their actual attitudes, they're more or less social democratic. Mm -hmm. uh, people say, yeah, we want a very small government, but we want more expenditures in health and education and uh, mm -hmm. uh, support for people who can't feed their children and so on, but just small government, but all the things that a big government does. In fact, even uh, attitudes on things like foreign, foreign aid are very interesting. Like in the polls about foreign aid, everyone says it's way too high. We're giving everything away to the undeserving foreigners. And when you ask them what foreign aid should be, this is about 10 times as high as it actually is. You know, because it's, uh, these are the results of extensive propaganda systems which uh, indoctrinate people into having certain conceptions. You know, everybody's stealing from us, uh, the poor are taken away, you know, the government's uh, putting the poor in front of us, uh, immigrants are flooding the country. Uh, I take, say, immigration. A huge concern about immigration in the United States, you know, Mexican uh, rapists and criminals. Uh, almost half the immigration is from Asia, educated, trained people who are being brought in to help develop the high-tech economy. It's about 40% of the immigrants. Uh, it's not what people are here, you know. Yeah. What they hear is something that doesn't exist, you know, Mexican criminals. Uh, but uh, it's pretty much the same in Europe. So, for example, in fact, it's very striking. I mentioned the other day the latest elections in Europe were in Sweden yeah. a couple of weeks ago, which, which again, uh, the right wing uh, did get a much higher percentage than yeah. everyone wanted, which is a frightening development. But there was a careful study of uh, the rise of the right in Sweden, and what it showed was very interesting and generalizes. Turns out that the rise of the right in Sweden was before the wave of immigrants. It was a reaction of people who were basically cast aside by the abandonment of the social democratic policies as the government, including the social democratic so-called left, uh, began to move towards uh, so-called austerity programs. You know, uh, people, the mass of the population is left out. Some people do fine. You know, they get rich, uh, the elites, as, as they're called. So what most of the people see is, well, those guys up there are doing fine and I'm left out. Uh, so I object and I'm going to respond by voting for the nationalist uh, xenophobic party. That was before the wave of immigrants. Once the immigrants come in, they serve as a convenient scapegoat. And so it's their fault. It's not the fault of the corporations up there. We don't see them. Uh, in Finland, where the, the same study showed, there's the same rise in the right-wing parties, but almost no immigration. Uh, if you take a look at the United States, it's quite interesting. In the, in the 2016 election, there have been extensive studies of why people voted for Trump. And almost all the studies say it's racism and sexism, which is not false. But the question is, why did these attitudes emerge? And if you look back, they emerge from people who were left out, who have been stagnating for 40 years, even worse, uh, wages declining, uh, benefits declining, organization declining. Those are communities that are ripe for a demagogue who can blame everything on a scapegoat. The racism is there, undoubtedly. Misogyny is there. Xenophobia is there. And it comes out of the bottle when people are angry and resentful and don't know where to turn to for explanation for their plight. I think the source of a lot of this is simply the neoliberal policies of the last generation, which were designed. They're not a law of nature, you know. They're designed to have certain consequences, which they have. And one of them is uh, leaving the mass of the population as what's sometimes called a precariat. You know, people living precarious existences, no security, uh, Pensions aren't coming, no organization, we, we have no, we're a sack of potatoes. Uh, we're going to look for somebody responsible. 
and the easiest place to look is people who are even more vulnerable than you are. Mm -hmm. And so it shows up in these dangerous antisocial attitudes. Uh, the decline of democracy is a consequence and in fact a desired consequence desired of the yeah, yeah. policies that were instituted. They overcome what was called the crisis of democracy, too much democracy. So now, yes, we've succeeded in reducing the crisis of democracy and with the consequences that follow from that. And how about resistance? Hmm? You said the system will not survive like this. Can't. How about can't? can't it's survive. impossible for a reason we haven't discussed. Wow. There are two huge crises uh, growing. One of them we, we know about, the nuclear threat. Uh, if you look at the history of the nuclear age, it's an absolute miracle that we've survived. If there was time, we could go through it. But case after case, uh, dozens of times, uh, sometimes by accident, mostly by accident, sometimes by reckless acts of leaders, we came literally within minutes of terminal destruction. Literally. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the cases are sh shocking when you look at them. And miracles don't continue. Uh, so sooner or later, we'll manage to destroy ourselves. Uh, the other is uh, uh, global warming, which is very serious. I mean, if the f use of fossil fuels continues at anything remotely like the present level, uh, by the end of this century, let's say, uh, uh, we might see sea level rising um, six to ten meters. You, know, you can just imagine what that would mean. Uh, plus uh, what we already see, uh, uh, severe weather, uh, uh, droughts, uh, you know, hurricanes, typhoons, uh, all escalating. And uh, it already has big effects, like the, uh, the Syrian war, for example. Uh, one of its roots is an unprecedented drought, nothing in hundreds of thousands of years of history, huge drought, surely the result of global warming, which drove peasants off the land into the cities, no way for them to survive. It creates a kind of a kindling, which uh, any spark will set off. Mm -hmm. It's part of the background for the uh, conflicts that arose. The same happened in Darfur. The huge drought uh, drove nomads into the agricultural areas. There's also ethnic conflict there that immediately led to conflict and confrontation, ended up with big massacres. Uh, these things are not, uh, are not just future. We're living with the beginnings of them. Uh, you take a look at Bangladesh, which is mostly a coastal plain. The sea level starts rising. Uh, what's going to happen to hundreds of millions of people? Uh, if the glaciers keep melting in the Himalayas, the already meager water supply in South Asia is going to be severely threatened. I mean, right now there are several hundred million people in India who do not have potable water. Uh, we're we're talking in Pakistan; it's going to be even worse. I mean, we're talking about the fate of hundreds of millions of people in the near future. Uh, the, the rich may think they can escape by going to a mountain somewhere, but that's not <laughs> going to happen. Uh, so and the policies that are being pursued are to escalate the problem. Yeah, yes, that's, that's it. it's not just not, and it's not just Trump. Um, take the big banks. You take a look at the JP Morgan Chase, uh, huge banks. Mm -hmm. They know exactly what the consequences are, and they're increasing their investments in fossil fuels. That's the nature of Capitalism, capitalism. The, as I said, it's we have a mixed form of capitalism, but there is a market system underlying it somewhere. And an imperative of the market system is that you try to make maximal profit tomorrow, and you disregard what are called externalities, mm -hmm. the things that are not Short charged term. on. Short term. Just and if you don't do that, you're out of the game. Yeah. It's part of the structure of the system. So Jamie Dimon, who's a smart guy, head of J.P. Morgan Chase, understands perfectly well the consequences, but nevertheless 
is compelled by the logic of the institutions to maximize the threat to his own grandchildren. Uh, he may not like it, maybe on the side he gives money to the Sierra Club, the environmental <laughs> groups, but uh, as it functioning within the system, uh, they're destroying the possibility for organized life. Uh, that is nothing that you can put band-aids on. This is much deeper. And of, of course, the uh, Trump administration, it's, it's just uh, the, by far, I mean, we ought to have big headlines in the newspapers every day saying these guys are trying to destroy the, the possibility of organized human life. And if you think about it, honestly, there's been nothing in all of human history to compare with this. Uh, not Attila the Hun, not Genghis Khan, not Hitler. Uh, horrible as they were, they never tried to destroy organized human life. This is something new. Uh, it, there's no word to describe it. Uh, evil doesn't capture it. It's uh, insanity doesn't capture it because it's not insane. It's planned yeah. and conscious and part of the very logic of the system in which they work. Now, of course, with Trump and his associates, they're trying to extend it, uh, make it worse. That's not part of the logic of the system. You could, the system could function with, uh, you know, palliative efforts to as Obama, in fact, was doing, and most of the world is doing. Not enough, but at least something. Uh, but it's a very deep problem. It's like uh, class hatred in Brazil. This is deep. You can't put a Band-Aid on it. It's fundamental things that have to be dealt with. And how about the resistance? Yeah. How about resistance? Resistance, uh, the, the, the movements against capitalism against these those well, things. Do you a, believe that it's going that's to That's the go? encouraging part of the story. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All over the world, uh, <laughs> there is, I mean, there is resistance and it's significant. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the most popular political figure in the United States by a considerable margin is Bernie Sanders, which is kind of unthinkable in the framework of American political history. It's never happened in American political history that somebody like Sanders could become even noticed, let alone become the most popular political figure in the country. Now just think of what happened. Uh, here's a guy, you have to recognize that American elections are literally bought. You, you, can, you can predict the outcome of elections with remarkable precision simply by looking at campaign funding, executive and Congress. It goes back well over 100 years. Uh, here's somebody who entered the campaign, un virtually unknown, uh, no media support, barely mentioned. If the media mentioned him, they just made fun of him, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, no support, zero from any of the funders, no corporate support, no support from private wealth. Uh, he even used... Uh, what's in the United States, a kind of four-letter word. The United States is, I suppose, the only country in the world, outside of maybe some dictatorship, where you can't say the word socialism, let alone communism, but it's just unspeakable. You know, it's the, it's, it's literally a four-letter word. It's a legacy of monetarism. Yeah, and he called him, he said he was a socialist. Socialist really means New Deal Democrat. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean mm -hmm. anything very See, profound. Okay. But, uh, mm -hmm. but with all of that, he came very close to winning the nomination for the Democrats. You, you are from for Hillary at that time. Pardon? You are for Hillary at that time. No. No? Not, not in the... After the nomination, yes, but that's not for Hillary, that's okay. against Trump. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's something quite different. She was awful. But uh, mm -hmm. if Sanders had been able to win the nomination, uh, frankly, I don't know what would have happened because the Republican propaganda machine 
which had not been directed against Sanders, and which is huge, corporate-backed, fantastic, it would be directed against Sanders. And what you'd start hearing is things about this uh, atheist uh, Jew, uh, oh. communist, uh, wants to destroy everything, you know, a ton of stuff like that. Uh, he prob probably couldn't have withstood it. Uh, but uh, so, so it's kind of unpredictable. But that's what certainly would have happened. That, mm -hmm. How people would react to that, you really don't know. Mm -hmm. It's hard. To, you can see it in England right now, the, the attack on Corbyn. Yeah. I mean, there's enormous fear, uh, including the the Labour Party. You know, the old Labour Party, mm -hmm. uh, the Guardian. You know, the, the idea that you might have a political party that actually represents the general public and its interests and suffering people abroad and is led by a decent human being. That's totally intolerable. So you have this enormous attack uh, of the kind that you can't defend yourself against, like anti-Semitism. As soon as you say somebody's a Holocaust denier or an anti-Semite, you know, uh, there's, there's no defense, basically. Uh, so, and it's just across the board, a huge attack on Corbyn and the Labour Party. Uh, and that's the kind of thing you would have seen if uh, if Sanders had mm -hmm. come in, you know, they'd mm -hmm. pick it a little differently. But the mm -hmm. uh, anti-Israel, you know, uh, all, all this huge propaganda, which is so familiar, you can just make mm -hmm. it up. Mm -hmm. But uh, so there's a lot to overcome. Mm -hmm. But uh, what the Sanders campaign showed and what the Corbyn success shows is that you can do quite a lot. Uh, these uh, Sanders and... Uh, uh, Yanis Varoufakis who just yeah. came out with yeah. a yeah. joint yeah. declaration. Varoufakis. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about this? this that's very this, important, this, I think. Uh, Varoufakis is a very smart, interesting what guy. Mm -hmm. They have. Uh, he, he's uh, the center of uh, uh, this new political organization, DM25, which is in fact running candidates, transnational candidates for the European Parliament and ultimately for in the Greek elections and later other ones, which is a kind of a counterpart to uh, Corbyn and Sanders. And the Varoufakis Sanders uh, declaration a couple of days ago is, uh, you know, it's, it's not radical, it's calling for sensible, multipolar, mm -hmm. dem liberal democratic inst structures. It wants to in the Euro Europe to preserve what's good about the European Union and to overcome the serious flaws, uh, same in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, things like the uh, uh, Obrador election in Mexico are another example. Uh, so I think if you look around the world, there's a, and the just plain level of activism, mainly among young people, mm -hmm. is quite surprising, striking. I think it's much higher than almost it's ever been, except for few few brief moments, mm -hmm. like 1968, there's a brief spike. But this is lasting. So I think the basis is sort of there if yeah. it can be brought together and organized. Mm -hmm.